tuning in to the online broadcast network, After Buzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads from over 200 countries and your number one source in after show entertainment. <laughs> TV, the destination for TV superfans, producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows, interviewing celebrities and showrunners, and bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E Entertainment's Maria Menunos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz begin! Hello, the Nick fans. Welcome to AfterBuzz TV's After Show for the Nick. Season 1, Episode 2, Mr. Paris Shoes. I'm Matt Lieberman. And uh, joining me, the panel is all here. Uh, I apologize that uh, Marissa and I were not here last week. I'm Matt Lieberman. Uh, Marissa Serafini's here. Hello. hello. And Oriana Leo is here. Hello, everybody. Yes. Uh, we've got a great show for you guys today. Uh, really, really excited about it. Jeremy Bob, who plays uh, Mr. Herman Barrow on the show, is going to be joining us Super over the phone phone uh, in just a few minutes. And uh, Oriana, you did such an amazing job with the premiere last week. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really glad to be here. I love this show. Uh, just like just sitting down and watching this episode, uh, it's just it's so amazing. The sense of place that we're given, how well designed everything is. But then, you know, just in terms of how Steven Soderbergh has made it his own thing by getting us right in there with this cinema verite style, with this handheld shoulder-mounted camera, with this moody electronic score. Love it. It's very much its own thing. It's hard to describe, but it's incredibly gripping from I, moment one. I agree, and I, I love the characters. They're all so intriguing in their, their own individual storylines that are already pulls in the audience. We're only two episodes in, and I like I want to follow these people and learn more about them. And like everything is just great. The look of it, the style, the music, mm -hmm. everything. Well, that's the fear, right? You you, you have a pilot that's so uh, visually stunning mm. that has a lot of intrigue for our main character that has a lot of big wow moments, um, and then you're worried: Are these other characters going to be fleshed out enough to make this show run? Right. And I think that this episode very deftly, uh, especially in the case of Doctor Edwards and Mister Barrow. Uh, supplies us with that character development that we need to fuel the rest of the season. And shout out to our guest Michael Begler from last week, one of the uh, the one one person of the duo of the co-creators, <laughs> co-EPs, uh, co-writers of this show, and he really spoke to that point mm -hmm. of just that you know Dr. Algernon is going to be be developed over time, that he's not just this simple guy who takes it on the chin and never stands up for himself. Oh, absolutely. And, and what I love about it is that we don't have to wait for it. Yes. That very, very quickly, you know, he realizes what his role is, the fact that he can't get fired because they need him in order to get the money from uh, Cornelia's parents, from their benefactors. So he's just going to do his own thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. I want to start talking about Mr. Barrow just because uh, Jeremy is going to be joining us very soon on the phone. Uh, so, you know, when we met him last week, he seemed like he kind of had uh, his head on straight in terms of running things here at the <laughs> hospital. But we learned very, very quickly through the faulty wiring that mm -hmm. got installed that he has been embezzling this hospital to the tune of thousands of dollars for God knows how long. And I don't think any of us saw this coming. Um, he is he is in debt to the tune of $9,000, which in 1900 is a crazy amount of money. A lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we don't quite know at this point why he's in debt or, or what he's been spending all this money on. Mm -hmm. Is it gambling? Is it drugs? Is it prostitution? He doesn't seem to be uh, druggy. He's not really. He's not really. Uh, he's not a Thackeray. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not in the Thackeray mold per se. What do you think? Marissa? I mean, it might be getting into predictions territory a little bit, but I think. Even though he doesn't have the personification of mm -hmm. maybe he is a druggie, but he is running a hospital. It might be for the drugs, just for the hospital. I mean, that, that's one of the possibilities. But and then how would he knows? be running up this bill if he can just get him for free from I'm, the hospital? It's interesting because we haven't. I don't think the audience has spent enough time with him yet to mm -hmm. understand where he's coming from, what it's for. So uh, they'll definitely be fleshed out. I totally agree with you. I am not clear on his motivations at all. I mean, yeah. he's he's a little bit likable. Yeah, but he gets a little scummy. You know this episode yeah. where I'm like, I don't know what you're motivated by, and I can't tell. Like you said, you're speaking as if this is like a personal debt, mm -hmm. but my feeling was that this was a debt he ran up because he doesn't know what he's doing. He's mismanaging everything. Okay. And he's, bar he's you know robbing Peter to pay Paul, but I didn't get the feeling that this was necessarily a personal 
mm-hmm. issue as much as he does not know what he's doing. So you're saying that mis- he's b- instead of telling uh, instead of telling Cornelia's instead parents of admitting fault. Right. He'd mm-hmm. rather borrow money from Mr. Collier to cover expenses that, that he's was, caused at the hospital. That was my assumption, okay. at least just because I don't feel like I have enough information. Yeah. And you know what? It's so funny. And, and we'll talk to uh, we'll talk to Jeremy about this when he's on the air. But he plays him. He is so naturally likable. I love watching this guy squirm. Yes. Um, yes. Because you're just kind of like, oh man, you're just getting yourself in deeper, aren't you? Yep. It's not like a you deserve this. Maybe he does. We don't quite know yet. Um, but I like watching him squirm, especially when he, uh, you know, so Cornelia and, Th- and uh, Thack corner him after uh, we lose uh, one of the nurses. And they're like, you know, how is this possible? We gave you 12 grand to get this done. He's like, it's a terrible tragedy. Damn, really? Uh, and it's, sh- oh. it definitely stinks. It's it's very fishy when he doesn't want to go to the attorney and he wants to figure it out. Just, just, yeah. get, just yeah. let me do it's, it on my own. You're like, oh, great. Yeah, it's very shady. And also it shows that just the politics that are going on in this mm-hmm. hospital, which are really fun to watch, too, because he he can't lose Cornelia or Thackeray so, because they are such vital people to the hospital. So he has to make everybody happy despite everything mm-hmm. that he's, he's doing. But he also seems like he's not... A, able to admit fault or wrongdoing. He doesn't want to get egg on his face. He doesn't want anyone to be embarrassed, especially himself. Well, yeah. but This see, is the web of lies. This is the slippery slope. Yeah. It seems like the one thing that he does have in his favor is, you know, even though they, he doesn't deserve it, he has their trust. Mm-hmm. So if he were to let that go, I imagine he'd be the first one kicked out of this hospital. You look at the people who absolutely are secure in their jobs. I mean, it's Cornelia, Thack, and Dr. Edwards. Mm-hmm. Right? That's pretty much it. Uh, so, yeah, he, he meets with the contractor, and the dude's like, uh, you know, like, you're seriously coming after me for this with all the money that you squeezed out of it? You didn't give me enough money for the job. What do you expect? Right. Yeah. Of course someone's dead. Don't put this on me. You didn't put proper installation of electricity the first time around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what, you're going to give me, how much? how much money can you possibly give me to make this thing work? I need a thousand dollars. And he's like, well, I'll give you, I'll give you eight hundred dollars. It's like, no, I said, I just said we need a thousand dollars to make this work. You don't, you don't learn your lesson. But I do mm-hmm. think now that you're talking about it, it makes me think maybe he is in really deep personally, just because mm-hmm. what other reason would he have to be playing with fire, so to speak, um, on such a huge level? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not just him. Maybe he has family or you another person kind of involved. Yeah. Maybe it's his like, wife. It, it might. He might have a personal motivation why he's still so in debt with this hmm. this loan. Okay, it's it's entirely possible. Um, and uh, I believe we have a uh, Jeremy Bob on the line. Jeremy, are you with us? I'm with you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, so we were just talking about Mr. Barrow's uh, constant misfortune this episode. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, he has a lot of that. Yeah, I have to assume that his misfortunes are not going to end anytime soon. Yeah, you might be right about that. Yeah, well, $9,000 is a crazy amount of debt in 1900. Did you ever ask the writers or anyone on set the, the exact equivalence of that kind of money? I... I did ask that at one point, but I couldn't tell you what they said. It was a while ago, but it's 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 a hell of a lot of money. I think I think so. In last uh, in, in this episode, they rewired the whole. They, they electrified the hospital. Mm-hmm. She gave me twelve thousand dollars to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that. I guess what it would cost to to wire and to you know to put electricity into a building. An entire these days, hospital. I'm sure it's, yeah. It's a yeah. nice chunk of change, Tens especially of of especially since it's a brand new technology. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it was a pretty high premium for getting that kind of done. Um, so nine thousand dollars representing seventy five percent of that sum is you know he's in he's in pretty big trouble. Absolutely. Um, so we were just saying, you know, like this is a guy who, because of his embezzling, he should be. We shouldn't like him, but I think just that it's a testament to you as a performer that we just we love watching him squirm. It's it's kind. It's oh, like really good. delightful to watch. <laughs> that's good. Well, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. That's mission accomplished. Then I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the 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 thing. 
actors generally try to do is is add some context and some uh, some understanding to to their uh, their villains' circumstances, so to speak. So mm-hmm. it's uh, you know if you can get people to sympathize and understand them a little bit, then you've done at least part of your job. Would you characterize him as a villain? Well, to a, to a degree. Yeah. I mean, he's a he's a, he's a delightful villain, but he's he's not a he's not a classic villain. But I mean, he's he's definitely got his fingers, as we'll find out, in some pots that they really shouldn't be in. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when you consider what's at stake, you know, you're you're messing around with. I mean, here here these these generous wealthy people have given this massive sum of money, the bulk of which I have taken for myself and gotten the electrification project done on the cheap you know i mean the the malkin the guy who the contractor is right when he says that nurse's death is on your hands mm-hmm. it really is you it's know? true like i i'm i'm terribly irresponsible and and it's not like i'm running an auto shop or something where you know no one's necessarily going to die at, at my hand like if, if you're messing with the quality of of the workmanship in a hospital you really are playing with people's lives so um in a way yes he is he is something of a of a villain i don't know that's quite it's not probably not quite the right word for yeah him, but, but he's, he's he, there, there are elements of it in there and he's, ultimately he's responsible for the patient on the table too mm-hmm. if there you know is an incident and that person we see a lot of the body counts rising and he's got that blood on his hands as well yeah, definitely, definitely. It's it's a uh, it's a tricky position, a very high pressure situation he's in. You know, um, so I mean, it, it's worth understanding. Like, you know, he's he's balancing a lot of things, but um, you know, more more will come to light that will clarify some of that as we go along. But uh, it's it's clear at this point that yeah, <laughs> he's he's not. Uh, maybe not everyone's favorite guy for good reason sometimes. Sure. Yeah, I wouldn't really say he's a villain per se. It was somewhat of an antagonist, but being uh, playing, portraying such a character who is a manager and has power and we see Thackeray and Cornelia kind of getting on his back a little bit about this whole electricity pr- problem that's going on. Are we going to see any other conflicts with any other characters that might test his power struggle? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. There's a lot more of that coming. I mean, um, it, yeah, his his power struggle exists in pretty much all the areas of his life, um, you'll come to find out. I mean, I don't want to reveal anything that will ruin the, uh, the viewing pleasure for anybody, but yeah, he, he, this, this definitely is not limited to his workplace, I'll, I'll say that much. Great. So, what can you uh, what can you tell us about uh, about working on set, working uh, working with Steven and working with the writers, and and obviously the wonderful cast. I mean, I have to imagine it was it was a, a game changing experience for you. Yeah, it def- I, it's definitely that. Um, you know, I, I I come mostly from the theater, so I've done I've done a lot a lot of theater over the years. I've lived in New York, and uh, in the last couple of years, I've started doing more. TV stuff, and um, at the time we started shooting The Nick, I was on another show uh, on CBS called Hostages, Mm -hmm. and um, I had occasion to be doing the first part of The Nick while I was still finishing my my through line on on Hostages. And I had a great experience both places, but the difference between traditional television um, production and the way Stephen works is... uh, really night and day I mean um, you know to have that comparison literally the same weeks I would I, would, I was working a couple of days one place and the rest of the week the other place uh, to finish out my storyline on the other show and you know I was amazed at how fast Stephen works I was amazed at how many hats he wears you know he's he's a camera operator he's a director he's a DP he's he's an editor and he's an, he's a producer and he he does all of those things as well as most of the people who do any one of those things alone. Right. And um, he, you know, I found that to be amazing. I also thought, you know, there's, we don't have any stand-ins or second team on set at all. So, um, you know, Stephen really leaves the collaborative uh, element of this work to be done really directly. You know, you're it's very hands-on and. You're very much a part of 
of the setup, like the way things get set up and how they're shot is determined during rehearsal before mm -hmm. you shoot. And how often I, is, I told my friend, uh, go ahead. sorry, how often is he behind the camera? Is he opping every shot? Every, he does have a B camera operator. So when he, when he, he'll do, um, dueling shots sometimes. Mm -hmm. So he'll shoot takes live. So he has, he can cut from the same take if he wants to, he has that option, but he, uh, but yes, he's shooting every setup. Oh my God. Every setup he shoots. As so a tech, he, oh, sorry. Um, as a technical director for Steven, how much freedom does he give you and the other cast members on, you know, and for you as an actor d developing your character, how much freedom does he allow you? Remarkably a lot. It, it's, it's why I, it, it's it's why I was so sh shocked when we first started working because he, I did I had about three meetings with him before we started shooting just to kind of get on the same page about things, mm -hmm. um, yeah. just about how he would work and stuff. But he really didn't talk to me very much about how he thought the character ought to be. Um, you know, a little bit of just basic stuff, but it it wasn't. He's not talking to you about what you're thinking right now or what you're going through right now. You know, right now this character is doing this or thinking that or don't forget he's got this experience to think about. It's not none of that. He really leaves that to you. And so, uh, you know, when I say it's been the, the greatest creative experience I've had in my career so far, it's because it really is a true collaboration. He trusts you to do the thing that you do because he's going to do the thing that he does. And he doesn't uh he really really counts on you you know and you'll you'll notice all the long takes you know like you're really out there he depends on your performance he's not cutting around anybody you know yeah. it's it's you really have to you know so in exchange for that freedom you know you you get all the scripts up front you've really got to prep every you got to know what you're doing because you also it's kind of like a play in that mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. and your theater background it's the most it, it's the most theatrical television experience I've ever had. That's wonderful. Because it's, it is exactly right. It's the most it's the most like theater that any TV job will ever be. I have a question about a particular scene this episode in which the collateral is taken from your mouth. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask <laughs> yeah. about how you played that scene. There's a lot of physical pain in this show. And I'm wondering, as a performer, how how does that work for you in as far as how you portray such agony um, on screen. Yeah, I, um, gosh, I, I, I would love to tell you that there was some heap of research I did about <laughs> the, uh, the level of pain that a tooth, <laughs> that a tooth extraction, uh, might give somebody, but, but, uh, you know, you're trying to, it's like anything else you're doing. You're trying to imagine yourself in that circumstance, trying to relate to it from your own experience and try to tell that story in a way that doesn't feel false. And, um, you know, that's kind of where my brain placed it. Uh, you know, I think the trick when I, when I, when I remember doing it and, um, my, my concern when I was watching it for the first time, I thought, I wonder how that will play because the, the, the dynamic there is that I can't, I wouldn't pull away from the guy or I wouldn't retaliate or fight against him in any way because mm -hmm. I can't. So there's a certain, like, it's a tricky balance. Like, how how much of this does he let happen? At what point does he stop try to st try to fight this guy from doing this? And I, I was pretty happy with how it turned out. That like, you can see that this guy probably could have squirmed enough to get a to make it more difficult than that to pull the tooth. But he also doesn't want to get killed, so yeah. he has to like, you know, that's the balance that I was trying to balance. I was trying to strike. Is the, the realizing most, realizing that you have to take the hit in order to stay alive. And there's exactly. this tremendous exactly. there's this yes. tremendous a, sense of inevitability. More, uh, that's a much better way to say that. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Uh, just uh, one more thing. Um, uh, obviously, before before you go, uh, just because we have so much that we need to talk about, um, is there an episode in particular that you're looking forward to the audience seeing this season, and why? Can you tell us anything? Uh, uh, gosh, it's hard. It's hard to say without. Um, revealing too much the, the next week's episode is a, is pretty is a pretty good one uh and then i would say uh the two or three episodes at the tail end of of the series it really ramps up in a way that is uh both for my character and for the for the whole world of the show it really ramps up in a way that uh 
it's very exciting, I think, and, and it really pretty amazing to consider that, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have imagined these things being on television, and here mm -hmm. they are. Um, very, you know, we're in such a magical time for TV right now, and so, it, you know, the things that are going to go on in this series are, you know, they're, I think it's really groundbreaking stuff that we've we've gotten to write into this show and that not we that they've that Stephen and uh, Michael and uh, Jack have have gotten to write into this show and you know and it, it's just a it's a it's a set of storylines that are really unique and and exciting so I think hang on for the end of it because it, it really this thing's been a locomotive you know it you establish things early and start chug and flow, and then mm -hmm. by the time the thing gets going, there's just no stopping it. It really is moving along. Absolutely. And it's pretty awesome. Absolutely. We, we wholeheartedly agree with you. We're so enjoying the series. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there is there anything else that you're, you're doing right now that you want people to be aware of? Well, uh, had we done this last week, I would have said come see King Lear in the park. Uh, but oh, I, wow. We just closed last night. I was doing uh, I was doing King Lear in the park with John Lithgow, and uh, but we just uh, we just closed last night. So congratulations um, on a successful so, yeah. run. Thanks a lot. But yeah, uh, yeah now I got to reel reel another one into the boat. We'll see what that comes. All right, uh, wonderful. Are you on Twitter at all? Can people find you? Sure, you find me at Jeremy Bob on Twitter. Okay, that's B-O-B-B. -B. Jeremy, thank you so much that's for right. joining us. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Congratulations on the series, and we can't wait to see hey, what comes next. All right. It's been fun talking to you. Thanks for having me. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. What a great guy. Yes. Yeah. Amazing insight. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we covered a, a large portion of uh, Mr. Barrow's storyline this week. Uh, you know, obviously now a, a tooth short and with only two days to go <laughs> to get the rest of this money. Uh, he's going to be really, really desperate come next week. So, uh, as, as he was saying, next week's a big episode. I wonder how he's going to get out of it. Yeah. Definitely something to look forward to. Okay, moving on. Uh, we got to talk about Doctor Edwards. We open with him uh, in his uh, in his dwelling in this hotel. We open on this cockroach oh. on the pillow, and it's just like it's great like, storytelling. But yeah, just it, the it image of the cockroach is enough like, to know this guy doesn't belong here. Yeah. Yes, Over, he's even his environment. He's the lowest of all the lowest places that he could mm -hmm. live with, with such a high degree of education that you're, he already has. He's in such a crap place. Yeah, he's doing what. Whatever he has to do to be in the same hospital as Dr. Thackeray, to learn from him, to work with him, to forward surgery in a meaningful way, and he's going to put up with whatever he has to put up with to do it. Uh, and as we see in this episode, he's not going to sit idly by. So uh, he, he leaves his room, he's getting ready to wash up, and this dude just starts messing with him. <laughs> he's like, he just, he sees this guy who obviously doesn't belong there because he's got these shoes from Paris mm -hmm. and it really pisses this guy off. Like, I mean, when you're dealing with somebody who maybe isn't very smart or, you know, didn't come from a great background, they get a little, they get insulted that someone like this guy why are you living here? Why do you think that you deserve to be here? We deserve to be here. Right. You should be off with your Paris friends and your mm -hmm. Paris shoes. I hate you. But also on the other end of that, we saw Edwards, the, the way he responded to that man, it mm -hmm. was very condescending too, you know? Yeah. He, he said, Paris, and then like five beats later, France. Well, because he know? didn't very respond. Condescending. Right. I mean, but I didn't see it as condescending. I saw it as like, he's such a fish out of water. He doesn't know how to behave. He doesn't mm -hmm. even know what he's supposed to be how he's supposed to act. He probably hasn't been in a situation like this in a quite a long time. I would say mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of both. Yeah. You know, um, he he also, I think on, on a lot of levels, thinks I don't deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. I should be somewhere else. Um, and he, I mean, can you imagine coming off the tail end of a trip to Europe where you are where being, you're a respected you're doctor? You're respected. You're in the theater. Everyone's mm -hmm. looking at what you're doing, and mm -hmm. you. This is the flip side. I mean, I can't I can't blame him for having an attitude problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I get it. Um, and obviously it comes it comes back on him uh, a little bit later. Uh, so yeah, he uh, he comes back to the hospital and he's doing rounds with Dr. Thackeray, Dr. Gallinger, Dr. Chickery, Chickering, and um, they've got these two patients uh, who are both suffering um, from potential aneurysms. The treatment that they're using isn't working, and uh, Dr. Edwards knows th knows this, and he's like, listen. When I was in Paris, we uh, we had this galvanic procedure and had a 60% success rate. 
It's unheard of. Which is unheard of for the time. Uh, yes. Absolutely unheard of. And and like Dr. Thackeray is like completely taken aback. Like you've got to be kidding me. Like there's no way you're like you're trying to get out of this you know place that I put you in. But you have to understand. Look, you're only here to keep the lights on. You're not even doing that well. So <laughs> right. don't try to horn in on my surgery. We're doing it my way. Come on, let's go. And mm -hmm. he he gathers his boys and he kind of rolls. Well, first he chops the hell out of that fuse box, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, he he's not being given any respect, and he's been reduced to having this office in the basement, mm -hmm. you know, dirty, it's like a dungeon. covered in soot. It is. Yeah, he's just Lowest being of the lows. Mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind, mm -hmm. essentially. It's like he's not even there. And uh, he's been being given very few duties to perform, namely just kind of working in uh, what is effectively the ER, the receiving room, where uh, people Sutures. are being patched up. Yeah, he's but that's first year's work, and he mm -hmm. even said that he's like, I'm not doing any responsibilities there as past the first year. Yeah, and we know he's way beyond that. And I just hate this the way this woman is acting towards him. He's doing such a great job stitching up her daughter's arm. She's like, must you touch her so much? Like, like as if he's like getting some kind of sick joy right. out of touching a white girl. Like, get over yourself, yeah. woman. Uh, and you know, he is, he's dealing with it as best he can. But as we realize over the course <laughs> of this episode, at least by the end of it, mm -hmm. the man's got anger to burn. Yeah. He's not mm -hmm. a happy person. And he's not a means. victim. Yeah. Like, I don't see him as someone who sees himself as a victim. Like, he 100%. really doesn't belong there. He doesn't deserve to be treated like this. He's got a very strong sense of self. Mm -hmm. And I love that because he really does take it on the chin first episode. Yeah. And like you said, we don't have to wait to see it bubble over. And I'm glad he kick the crap out of that guy because there's only one way we all know from the playground to mm -hmm. stand up for yourself when someone's picking on you. It's true. And in this case, this guy was going to get violent. And this isn't the first fight that he's been a part of. It's obvious from his stance. The man's been trained. Mm -hmm. He's a mm -hmm. boxer. Yep. He knows how to he knows how to move and he's got a strong cross. <laughs> strong. <laughs> but I, I love how he's taken all this energy and making is He's putting it in a very constructive way, you know, creating mm -hmm. this new clinic and um, this makeshift clinic of himself. It's like he's doing it for the better of the community, not for the worse. Well, absolutely. He's like he sees, you know, he sees this uh, this black woman. She can't get treatment at the best hospital in, you know, in his mind and in our mind in town. Mm -hmm. She can't get treatment there just because she's uh, an African-American. Mm -hmm. So he tracks her down. Um, because she can't get treated at the free clinic because they're, they're so backed up, she doesn't have the time, and he works with her all night over the course of several hours to heal her, and he's already got getting new patients. He's basically, he's saying with this, like, if you won't let me practice medicine, but you also can't fire me, I'm going to practice medicine my way on my people right. who deserve it, and you're going to foot the bill. Right. Period. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do about it. I love that. Yes, 100%. It's yes. great. You get to begin to see how gentle he is. Like you said, he spends hours draining this woman's arm. Mm -hmm. And cocaine's a hell of a drug because mm -hmm. that is what yeah. is allowing a lot of these procedures to even take place. It's true. But it's remarkable to see that, you know, part of me, I feel like he's doing it. He likes, he wants to, he's going to want to twist the knife at some point mm -hmm. for the Nick and the doctors. Like, look what I'm doing. Well, but he's really doing it from a good place. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And I think, like, I think that's why we all love his character because he is such a good person. I don't really see him in it for the money. He's just mm -hmm. doing it for the love of medicine, for the love of helping other people. He yeah. comes from a good place. And like it's ironic, said. too, because last episode we see Dr. Thackeray give his, you know, his ovation, his big speech at the funeral about this particular time in history and how so much has, is changing. They're learning so much. They're advancing so mm -hmm. much. Ironically, he's, you know, but then he's performing like psychological warfare, yeah. Dr. Edwards, mm -hmm. essentially. But they come from the same place. They have the same enthusiasm. Yeah. And we as an audience get to see that they're just as good as one another. And I think, you know, and we'll talk about it a bit when we get into Dr. Thackeray, but that flashback scene and seeing his enthusiasm when he was a young, uh, you know, a young surgeon trying to get in with Dr. Christensen and just his passion for the field of surgery, furthering the field of surgery, extending the lifespan of his fellow human being, Dr. Edwards just wants the same thing. And mm -hmm. I love that it's humanizing both of them in the sense mm -hmm. of like, okay, we know that the only difference here is the color of the skin and from the inside, 
they're essentially the same man, only one's not drug addicted. It's true. Two sides um, of the same coin. Yeah. It's true. All right, uh, we we have to move on. Uh, just because we've we've got so little time, I just want to really quickly talk about iTunes, uh, folks. I don't know if you're new to AfterBuzz TV. If you are, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Here's the thing: uh, we here at AfterBuzz TV, we we put out between 60 and 70 hours of free content every week. It's a massive undertaking, and we need your support to continue to make that happen. We don't ask for any money. We don't really want much of your time. All we want you to do: go to iTunes, where I'm sure many of you are actually getting this podcast from, and rate and review the show. We love five star reviews. If that's how you feel, let us know. It's the best way for us to know that we're doing a great job and we're giving you the Nick podcast that you want and you deserve because if you're watching this show and it's a great show, you want great commentary to go along with it. So go to iTunes, rate and review the show. It also helps us get sponsors that fund what we do, that keep our lights on, that keep our doors open, and it's how we're able to get great guests like Jeremy on the show. And we have so many more great guests planned for you over the course of this season. My excitement is just <laughs> through the roof about it. Uh, we all are. And uh, it, it legitimately helps everyone here rate and review the shows that you watch or listen to. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I just want to get into just because he has a, a run-in with Mr. Barrow. I want to talk about Cleary really quickly. Such uh, a great character. I yeah. Love him. He's, but that's like it's another person who's like so grimy and terrible, but at the same time so incredibly endearing. Just mm -hmm. like he's got this smile on his face. He's got a lust for he's life. Always yeah. cracking jokes. Mm -hmm. I, but I, poor I, none. Yeah, I love it. But it's like, but so much. Depth that's going on around the the environment there's like some levity and all these serious characters mm -hmm. that we're already seeing it's nice to have a comedic character it's within. true but it's also so incredibly perverse it yes. was it is yeah but it's nice to have a laugh here and there in such a dark story. But we get to see different characters develop their own coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know, we see Dr. Thackeray is a drug addict because how else are you going to deal with this amount of bodies at, you know, at your feet? Yeah. But then you, yeah. start to, you see Cleary doing the same thing, but taking the ring off the dead body. Like, he has no regard whatsoever. No shame. Know? But that's his coping mechanism. How else do you survive this world with typhoid fever and TB and it's just people dropping like flies yeah. and he makes his money off of it. He has to see the world that way. Yeah, he desensitizes, yeah. desensitizes himself uh, and he's trying to uh, to bilk the hospital for every dime that he can get from them, trying to pass off this dead body as alive, <laughs> for God's sake. Nope. Uh, yeah, and uh, ultimately he, uh, he helps uh, Dr. Chickering and Dr. Gallinger uh, steal these journals uh, from uh, from this <laughs> office in the middle of the night, and he's showing off all these like horrifying uh, medical photos. Elephantitis. Elephantitis yeah. and gigantism, uh, <laughs> and he's just having uh, just laughing it up. And then he takes all of his uh, all of his money from uh, his uh, his work for the month and blows it at the bar, getting whiskey after whiskey and recounting. Uh, it, it seems like he's one of the only guys, if not maybe the only okay. guy in the bar that can read. Um, and he's recounting uh, this uh, boxing match between an Irish fighter and, a, and another fighter. And uh, he cracks a joke at one of the other guys. He takes a swing at him. And I just love how he just kind of like <laughs> goes Hulk Hogan. He hulks out. He's like, you know, Cleary of County Cork, you know. And he just starts wailing on him until his nemesis from last week, Sister Harriet, is getting out of a carriage in the wrong part of town. Mm -hmm. She's not wearing her habit. What's up with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Turns out, Sister Harriet is a secret abortionist. Mm -hmm. um, which, again, I love this development for her character. I love that he's catching her at it. Um, because I, I like this pairing. I like that they have something to do together. I like that he has one up on her because she has the moral high ground, or so it seemed until right now. Yeah, and it's nice to have a story outside of the hospital, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting, because it feels like right now we're just in one location, but then you, when you broaden everything, it then makes it more interesting. Agreed. And she does, you know, the the patient does say, you know, will God forgive me kind of thing. And mm -hmm. she, she does have that moral authority, but she clearly... She clearly is an interesting character that's going to have, has these conflicts. Yeah. You know, she already is kind of a uh, bad mouth, you know, clearly <laughs> she talks back. She's a tough talking nun. Like, w that's not something I would have expected. Mm -hmm. But clearly her worldview is a lot broader than just the habit. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Her view of Christianity and of, you know, what God will and won't allow and what is right for the world, not just heaven and hell, is so very complex for the time. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciate that we're seeing someone who's trying to, is seeing all these people who are trying to inject a more modern world into one that is just waking up to the possibilities 
of the modern age. And we see this the tremendous amount of suffering on all fronts, you know, oh, yeah. just mm-hmm. the the children that are working in the factories, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the race relations. It's just it's amazing how much suffering is going on and I can relate to her in the sense that she obviously feels like she's alleviating some suffering. Right. Yeah. And I love how each of these characters individually are kind of going against the stereotype. I mean, we have the African-American doctor you think would be one way, and we have the the nun who would you think would be in one way. I mean, it's really interesting, all just the character developments of everybody, especially for that time. So many people... And we're only two episodes in. I yeah. Know. I love that we're subverting so many stereotypes. Uh, I love that we have these two together. I just want to check in on Cornelia, Mm -hmm. Um, who has this great scene with her parents where she's kind of talking about how, you know, like, I love what I'm doing. Like, it's not just an imposition. I really do love this position. Sometimes I worry that they don't take me seriously. And her father makes this comment that he's just kind of like so, like, flippant. But it's true, where he's like, if you had been born a man, you'd be running this whole city by now. And that's got to, you know, she smiles, but it's eating at her Of course, it stings. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But yeah. women, women in power was completely different at that time, too. Mm-hmm. So for her to be such high in power already, I mean... It's very it, rare. It's very rare. So, like, the fact that she's questioning it, it's very, you know, that's, everyone's going to be questioning her because she's a woman in such a high position. I mean, it's great that that's true to real life, too. And also no, the nepotism factor of, like, when you know someone has a job only because of who their parents are, mm-hmm. you don't take them seriously. Male, mm-hmm. female, whatever. You're just kind of like, oh, yeah, well, you were born lucky, and now you have this job. So that's against her as well. Yeah, and uh, hopefully uh, as time goes on, we're going to see her uh, get to accomplish more and not be held back by this kind of position and by her parents kind of laissez-faire attitude mm-hmm. uh, towards what she's doing and she's doing a whole hell of a lot. I'm not mm-hmm. sure if it's this if it was this uh, episode or last but there's a scene where she's getting dressed. This scene, yeah. And yeah. this episode. It really hard, you know, we don't take that kind of time and care to get dressed anymore. That mm-hmm. was a really big deal. You had handmaidens that would help Multiple dress you. Handmaidens. Yes, and the the accoutrement, the costuming of every mm-hmm. the, of what she had to wear was really intense. And I felt like I loved the cinematography of that moment and that she was kind of putting on her armor, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's a dress. It's a corset. But for her, that's her armor to be taken seriously. Absolutely. And and also, the the father did say the line that everyone thinks they come from new money, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So they even have that factor going against going against everybody. Absolutely. Uh, Another person we need to check in on is Gallinger, who is still galled. Uh, it's almost a pun, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> uh, at the fact that uh, Dr. Edwards got the uh, assistant chief of surgery, uh, and his wife shows up at the at the hospital, and we get to meet his wife and his infant daughter, who's nine months old. Um, she takes a picture with the camera. Yeah, the I love. Very expensive. Yeah. I loved very. this moment. This like it's like little moments of humanity outside of plot, where he sticks his tongue out at the camera, and I'm just. I, you rarely see those photos when you get to see photos from that era of just people being people mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. being silly and being sweet. Everything's so composed because that's how that's how we view that time. But people will always be people. Right. And mm-hmm. and uh, I just I wish I hope we get to see that photo. That would be very very nice. <laughs> um, in any case. Uh, he and uh, Dr. Chickering are so adamant to not have to work with Dr. Edwards that they steal this journal in French, which they can't even (laughs) read. It's such a ludicrous crime that they're committing. Mm -hmm. Like, they're breaking into a library for documents. I mean, but just because they can't admit, they cannot refer to Dr. Yeah. Edwards. Right. They, But this procedure is too good for them to ignore it. They just have to try to learn it themselves, learn by reading, not by doing. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, Dr. Thackeray, mm. obviously. Uh, he uh, he's, remem- he's still very deeply affected by the death of his mentor, Dr. Christensen. Um, and we get to see this wonderful flashback to when, basically, his interview. Uh, and it's like it's like the subtle changes that make us feel like Clive Owen is so much younger. It's his attitude. It's his enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. The hair is a bit thicker. The mustache is way thicker. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Christensen is like, you know, look, w- I'm lucky because I have this lab. People are trying to make medicine happen, you know, um, 
uh, somewhere else. It belongs here. It belongs here where we can experiment and we can refine processes. Uh, it's the only way that we're going to learn anything about how to fight these diseases. And Dr. Thackeray is just like, this guy is a rock star. Yeah. And he even <laughs> says, he's like, you know, uh, Dr. Christensen mentions that, that fame mm -hmm. is part of, part of his motivation. He wants to be remembered. He wants to go down in history. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Thacker is just all about, like, you're legitimizing surgery. Mm -hmm. That's why I have to be here. I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to be here, and I'm going to work with you because that is what you're doing. And, like, I know that he's, like, coke-addled, but he's got to recognize that he essentially had that same conversation with Dr. Edwards last week. It's got to be. I don't know he would let himself... Like, right. admit that. But we as an audience get to see that there really isn't a Well, difference. I mean, last week he, he did say, look, you know, I'm not saying you're a bad surgeon because you're black. I'm saying that you being here is a distraction that will prevent this hospital from running at the efficiency that it needs to run at for me to do my work. He's, he's That's the tone he's setting, though, because he could set a different tone if he wanted to. Oh, he absolutely could. Patronizing tone. Yeah. It's a patronizing tone, but it's not it's not it's not the flat out racism that one would expect from someone of the period. Right. It's it's not necessarily saying you're a bad surgeon. It's saying you if I hire you, if I treat you as an equal, which you very well could be based on your experience, it will put my hospital in jeopardy. And that is a far more complex position, complex emotion. Um, and uh, as he's remembering uh, his mentor, he gets a visit from uh, Dr. Christensen's wife, uh, or his, his widow. Mm -hmm. And um, she's like, you know, I failed him as a wife. I could have done so much more. I tried to like loosen the valve, but it, it just, it wasn't enough. And he's like, you know, you can't blame yourself for what this job does to people. And then he explains very clearly mm -hmm. that his mistake was identifying with the patient and not just the procedure yeah and that that's what he, you have to do to be successful is to only identify with the procedure and not the patient and of course she asks well how do you do it and he's like yeah i i got i, I got ways yeah and yeah. It, it it's interesting the irony in in all of it because they're studying new modern western med medicine now and the fact that the, the medicine and the science that and all these procedures that they're doing and learning about in these last few years still can't save them in that way and that like J.M. Christensen still died and mm -hmm. just like just everything they're doing right now they can't help themselves yeah absolutely well and we see that with you know obviously his opium use and opium done yeah. and, and in, in this episode obviously he goes off his schedule you know mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. day and it shows how deep how deep he really is and how much he needs that to go on. Yeah, and just how many years it seems like he's been using this regularly. Now, to to have four bowls of opium in one night and then cocaine all day, mm -hmm. the guy yeah. is pretty much, like, screwed biologically. Can we just say? I mean, if... if and physically. Yeah. And yeah. Physically. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Biologically. You know, the nurse does say in that scene that we'll get to, but, you mm -hmm. know, they're all collapsed. All your veins are collapsed. Oh, from last oh, week. From yeah. last week. I mean, talking about the main vein that he uses, mm -hmm. but we see that there is nothing, <laughs> he doesn't have any other options anymore mm -hmm. to keep going, but yeah. he's, such, he's such a prolific functional junkie. Exactly. Well, I mean, speaking of the main vein and uh, the, the nurse who cured what ailed him, uh, Nurse Elkins, uh, in his mind, has been uh, avoiding him, and he's kind of like, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's a crush yet, but at the very least, uh, it's a very it was a very personal intimate moment that he shared with another person and he's got a little bit of a fixation yeah I would say he's very he's aware of her in a far more focused fashion than he ever was before and I thought it was kind of big of him you know he just cut her down to size mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and here he is he's not apologizing for the way he's treated her no and he is still trying to you know cover his own behind mm -hmm. make sure she doesn't share what she's done and seen but there is that sensitivity I feel like that he knows he's maybe gone a little too far and that now's the time to kind of make amends. Right. Yeah. But I like all these little moments that he has with everyone at the hospital that, I mean, he'll treat people a certain way, but that's just him as a person and as a character, which is I find interesting. He's, like, condescending to one person, but very sweet to another. So, I mean, it makes his character very questionable in some ways. Yeah. It also seems like he's not, we know that he's not in control. Mm -hmm. And when he gets angry and lashes out, I feel like that's the 
darkness. That's the addict. Like that's that part of him that he cannot control. Mm -hmm. And everyone is going to accept it because he's at the top of his game. You know, he is the legend. But I feel like that's a little window into him losing it. Well, absolutely. Because you look at the person we saw in the flashback. And that's the person who was talking to Nurse Elkins. Mm-hmm. That's the person who uh, cheers on Bertie and Gallinger and says hi to Gallinger's wife and his daughter. That person still exists. All of the the darkness in him is just the pain of all the people that have been lost because their success rate is so low. The mm-hmm. odds of surviving all of these illnesses are so drastically low and it's it, that's why we opened the series the way that we did with such this brutal death is just to make you aware mm-hmm. most people who go to the hospital don't come back no. out and yeah. that you know from the from a modern perspective it's like oh well they're going to get surgery maybe they're going to get better these people are all going to die anyways yeah. yeah so they are great candidates for surgery that will most likely kill them mm-hmm. and the only way that they can progress is to take these chances and it, it really gives you that sense of gravity of what these physicians are dealing with. Well, I mean, you you look at the round scene where Dr. Edwards is talking about the galvanic procedure, and he and, and he tries to say the procedure that uh, that Dr. Thackeray is talking about has a zero percent success <laughs> yeah. rate, and he's like, "Nope, we're doing this one," and it's just like we're gonna make it work. We're gonna work until it works. But it also shows how much power they have because they mm-hmm. are so educated and they know their science. The fact that everyone has so much faith in them that they can do all these risky procedures and still probably know that everyone's still going to die anyways. Yeah. It just shows how powerful they are. Well, and it, we see how kind of cocky he is of yeah. last episode when he does the essentially his very first um, uh, when, when he ejects into the spine that he'd only done on his dog before. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, he's just like he's making a joke of like, oh, I'm, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't miss that dog as he's doing it to the man. Yep. I, yeah. You know, I guess you have to have that sort of swinging dick mentality, but it's also... <laughs> You gotta go for it. If it well, it's to. just it's you need, Well, I feel like if you don't have an absurd level of nerve, you can't have it at all mm-hmm. when you're faced with that much failure. Um, and to have like a ridiculous level of hope, hope, uh, insane hope, crazy hope, boundless, stupid hope. Without that, you're basically you're lost, and you you kill yourself. And, and without you're that, we wouldn't be where we are today with all this amazing it's the medical truth. technology. Yeah. So there are two big problems facing Dr. Thackeray in this episode. One is the electricity, and it's so illustrated well in this scene in uh, with this procedure that's going really well and could actually work if the wiring wasn't complete garbage. <laughs> so you yeah. Catch the poor man on fire. Yes, catch, catch him on fire, kills a nurse, I mean, it's like we're so close. We're so close to moving medicine forward. And why is it, Mr. Barrow, that you are holding me back with your sheer incompetence? <laughs> like, that's the level of frustration. That's like monumental Atlas frustration, yep. like holding up the world frustration. The other thing is he needs fresh cadavers to experiment on and to try out these procedures on because everybody and their mother is getting into the surgery game and has more money to spend. Right. Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, it's all these outside factors that are hindering their medicine that's preventing them from being as best as they can be. Mm-hmm. I, and I, you, that's great. It's funny too. You can see that he mate doesn't really care about the lights being on so much. Like, who cares if it's electrified? If we could get the bodies instead, we'd be able to further medicine. The electricity is just. It's nice to have. It's not a need to have, I think, for him. Yeah. They and open the shades. You know, they make do. They figured mm-hmm. it out. Yeah, but that's not, it's not a solution. Not no, by a not. long shot. No. Um, yeah, so by the end of the episode, uh, Dr. Thackeray retires to his uh, his regular opium den. He enjoys four bowls and is about to enjoy an orange. Uh, he drops a but a boatload of money on that table. I have to wonder a how much he's earning and how much of it is going uh, into his lungs and into his feet. Uh, I have to I have to wonder. But uh, in I would any say case, most of it he doesn't seem like he goes home very often. He mm-mm. doesn't seem to eat anything. He just lives there. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, because yeah, we even saw. I believe it was the first episode when we saw the nurse go to his place. I mean, it's a humongous, gigantic place, but no one was there except for Thackeray. Yeah. He doesn't even have any live-in servants. Family. Nope, there's no one there. It's no a ghost one. town. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, I think it is time we talk predictions. Ooh. And now, your After Buzz TV predictions. Uh, okay, so 
I, I'm kind of, I'm in a pickle here. I don't know, Oriana, how far you've watched ahead. We, we both received some screeners. Mm -hmm. So I have seen the next episode. Um, so I don't want to give anything away. I'm just going to give kind of my hopes for this season based on this episode. Please do. Um, I just, I really like that Dr. Edwards is doing this clinic. I really want to see where that goes. Uh, I, I think that it's great that he's an active character. I'm also really curious about what is obviously a large level of anger inside of him, and I want to see that continue to be explored, again, in an active fashion. Um, obviously, Mr. Barrow has two days to get his money to Bunky. I wonder how that's going to happen. What do you guys think? Well, I definitely think that they're going to find out about Edward's makeshift clinic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the fact that I think someone's in the, in the process of everything. They're going to find out that medicine is being used, but they don't know where it's going to, and it's mm. going towards Edward's clinic. So that's definitely going to be found out by whoever's crunching numbers. And that also, if someone's crunching numbers and they're looking at all that, they're going to also wonder where's all of our liquid cocaine going. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's all hospital cocaine. True. Right. I mean, they're going to get audited eventually. <laughs> but uh, I, I definitely think people are going to find out about that, and Edward's mm -hmm. is going to get in trouble. So I'm not sure... Because he's so educated and they do need him on the staff, because he's so vital, I'm not sure if they're going to fire him for that, but he's definitely going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. I agree. I predict that he's going to start some serious problems because he has to be there, we know, essentially to keep the lights on, but now he's doing his own thing and it's only going to shine light on him um, and then create even more problems for Cornelia and for Mr. Barrow. So I just see a complete... Uh, Shitstorm, if you will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But fortunately, what I love about the show is I love the pacing and mm -hmm. our the, the amount that we're going to learn about each character in every episode. So I'm just so excited to see to go deeper and to every storyline. Yes. Fantastic. I 100% agree. I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank our special guest, Jeremy Bob, for joining us on the show today. He was really fantastic. Uh, you can follow him, I believe, at, uh, at Jeremy Bob yep. on Twitter. Uh, and folks, we're going to be here next week giving you an all-new episode of The Nick. Uh, Marissa Serafini, where can the people find you? You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Serafini TV. Okay, and Oriana? You can find me on Twitter at Miss Oriana Leo, or Instagram is Oriana Leo, and I'm also doing The Killing after show right now so check us out there oh fantastic and you can find me on twitter at the, at matt lieberman that's m-a-t-t-l-i-e-b-e-r-m-a-n you can find all my videos for source fed and source fed nerd on youtube and i also did a bunch of great videos for uh d news and their related networks uh this past week check out all of them as well uh i'm also doing uh, ray donovan and the strain on sundays check those out thank you all so much we'll see you next week good night From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.